Welcome, everyone. So I have a request. Students, can you please move up a little bit? That would be really super great, because we want to hear from you as well. So if you can, move up. We have a lot of seats up front, OK? Whenever you get the chance. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Marcy Robinson, Director of Events and Conference Services. Um, and it's great to have you here once again. Um, we love our At Noon series. So as part of our Scripps Presents At Noon Lunchtime series, uh, we feature conversations with renowned scholars, writers, performers, and thinkers for which the Scripps Presents Signature Event series has become known. Our At Noon Lunchtime series allows members of the Scripps community and the broader Claremont community uh, to learn from contemporary luminaries in between classes, research, and work. And as I've said, the Scripps College and Claremont communities are full of lifelong learners who are eager to participate in these types of thought-provoking events, and we do love hosting them. So today, we are, we are hosting Alejandra Campo Verde. <laughs> Alejandra is a nationally recognized women's health advocate, author, founder, producer, and former White House aide to President Obama. Yeah. Claps for that. <laughs> Alejandra is the author of the upcoming book, First Gen. She produced and appeared in the groundbreaking PBS documentary, Inheritance, and founded the Latinos and BRCA Awareness Initiative in partnership with Penn Medicine's Basser Center for BRCA. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it is a gene mu mutation, and I know that you're going to be talking about it a little bit later on. So previously, Alejandra served in the White House, in Obama's White House, initially as special assistant to the deputy chief of staff for policy, and later as the fir first White House deputy director of Hispanic media. Alejandra holds a master in public policy from Harvard's, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and graduated cum laude from the University of Southern California. She currently serves on the board of Harvard's Shorenstein Center of Media, Politics, and Public Policy, the Friends of the National Museum of the, Amer of the American Latino, and also the California Community Foundation. Joining Alejandra in conversation is Elba Mandujano. Elba joined Scripps College community a year and a half ago and serves as the Scripps Communities of Resources and Empowerment, as we know it as SCORE, as the Assistant Director, and the First Generation Program Coordinator. Born and raised in South Central Los Angeles, Elba received her BA in Psychology with a minor in Spanish from the California State University. And her MA, and that's in Los Angeles, by the way, and her MA in Student Affairs Administration from Michigan State University. As a first generation working class bilingual queer Chicano, Elba aims to create intersectional spaces that honor and uplift, uplift the multifaceted individual. She is passionate about creating spaces for storytelling as a healing and community building tool student retention, engagement, and equity in education. Elba has also, has also shared with me that she is beyond excited and honored to be sharing the stage with Alejandra Campomerde. So please, with that said, please welcome both Alejandra and Elba to the stage. Hi, everyone. I can't think of a better person to have this conversation with, Elba, so thank you so much for engaging and agreeing to engage with me. Did you want me to do a reading first, or do you want to? Yeah, let's start with the reading. Okay, great. So I was just going to read a little bit from the book, and, but then save time to just jump right into the conversation. 
Um, I'm on page three, if anyone's following along. You don't have to follow along. <laughs> to be a first and only in America is a delicate balance of surviving where you come from while acting like you belong where you're going. Success in the former does not make the latter any easier. In fact, the more effective you are at surviving, the larger the experience gap there is to bridge. But in reality, first and onlys aren't crossing a bridge at all. We are the bridge, painstakingly stretched from where we come from to where we hope to arrive. The trailblazer toll is the emotional cost of social and economic mobility. It's the tax we pay to become the proverbial bridge. I conceived of the phrase because up until now, I've seen surprisingly little about the comprehensive emotional experiences of first and onlys. Some aspects receive a lot of attention, while others are rarely publicly acknowledged, despite being widespread, normal, and even expected. And therein lies the problem. Shifting a paradigm is isolating and terrifying work, and we rarely talk about that part. We focus on the victory lap instead. It would have been easy standing at the podium that day at Harvard to share the glossy version of my life neatly packaged into six words, from welfare to the White House. But using such an oversimplified shorthand would have been incomplete at best and misleading at worst. And all too often we're conditioned to do just that, to be so grateful for our opportunities and so protective of our fragile new status that we leave no room for questions, doubts, or our own humanity. But it's unreasonable to create the expectation that any of us can navigate social mobility unscathed. So that was from the prologue, and the book itself reads like a narrative, like a story, but in the prologue, I really wanted to set up the, the basic idea and the reason why I wrote this book, and I know we're gonna get into all of that with the questions. No, thank you so much, um, Alejandra. And I just wanna take a moment to sit in that and just show again Alejandra some love, um, because I read this book in like 48 hours because I could just not put it down. Um, it was so real for me. Um, as also, as um, Marcy mentioned, just being first gen, being Mexican American. And so I appreciated everything that you shared with us. And so I wanna start off by just asking a little bit about um, why you decided to write this memoir and specifically focus on, as you use, first and onlys, right? Um, as opposed to just like the first gen experience. What inspired you or motivated you to write on the first and only experience? So I, I touched on this a little bit in the beginning of the book, and it really crystallized for me when I was giving a speech at a university some years ago, and it was to students, and I had an introduction just like the one that just happened, because you know that's how we all kind of get introduced by these bullet points, and I remember thinking like, wow, all the truth is like the reality, and the good stories are not in that introduction. The spaces between those bullet points are where our lived experience are, and for me, it wasn't always on a linear trajectory, and I felt that that was too glossy. It was scrubbing that part out, and when I was talking to students like yourselves, I was like, that's not really helping anyone to make it seem like I figured everything out and did everything great, and you can do it too. Let's have a real conversation about all the things you gain, but all the things you lose along the way, if anything, to prepare right, but also to connect. Because one thing, and we'll get into this about the first generation experience, is that it's super isolating. Even though, if we were all honest about it, we all feel very similarly. So I expand the term first gen for the purpose of my book to not just be about, you know, I, I'm a first generation daughter of an immigrant from Mexico, and a lot of times people think of the Latino community and there is a, a big demographic of first gen young people that are Latino, but it's also first gen to break out of a cycle of poverty, first gen to move out of your community, first generation go to college, first professional in your family. And some of us have several of these boxes that we check, maybe all of them, and some of us have a few, but there's one thing in common which is there are emotional experiences 
to unravel throughout that journey of crossing these emotional and societal thresholds? Um, no, I definitely appreciate that. And I loved first and only just because I think it, for me, I think it was easier to label my experiences being, and, and it just made me, I think when I think about first gen, I specifically just think about education. Mm -hmm. And when I read first and only, it made me think about so many other parts of my life that where I am the first and only. So, so thank you for, for bringing that concept. Um, so at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the book, you mentioned that you are going to keep it real with us. And real you kept it, as I read through the book. And so um, you shared many experiences from your childhood to your adult um, years. And as you noted at the end, um, this process brought up so many memories and feelings. And so I'm curious to know how your writing process was and how you essentially also took care of yourself through um, this writing, um, and if there were maybe some days that were more difficult than others as you, or chapters as you relived some of these experiences? That's a great question and, and a right question because anyone who reads a book knows that you can tell if somebody's telling the truth or fully being honest, you know, that comes right off the page. And if I'm going to be writing about trauma or, or writing about emotional experiences, I had to kind of go there. And it was a physically activating experience as well as emotionally activating. I wear an aura ring, you know, one of those tracker rings. And I started noticing that my heart rate would really increase when I was writing. And I was just sitting in a chair. And so I started checking in my aura tracker. And it would go from like 55 beats per minute to like 150 while I was sitting in a chair writing. So you know, you're, you're reopening in a lot of ways boxes that we put lids on or things that we shove down because a lot of our experiences first and only is, is to kind of survive, to morph, to survive, to move fast. And there's this saying, when you are skating over thin ice, your speed is your safety. And I've, I felt that way. And I, I know a lot of us do. You know, you're, you're making it through, you're getting to the next step, you're surviving, you're figuring it out. But a part of what we don't always have grace for is taking a moment and, and, and looking at how is that affecting us, right? How, how is that affecting our relationships? How have the things that have happened before we got to school now affecting how we interact? The, the hardest um, chapters to write to your, to your question were the pre-birth chapters because I went into my family's history and the childhood chapter. The pre-birth, so the first of the trailblazer toll, and there's about, there's eight components that kind of, I use my story to lay out what co different component each chapter, right? But the very first one is our invisible inheritances, and that's taking a moment to think about, you know, the cycles that we were born into. Maybe the cycles we were born to disrupt, which is a lot of pressure, I know. Maybe the cycles that we were born to continue, and I thought I kind of understood that until I went to grad school and I learned about this thing called a genogram. Does anyone know what a genogram is? I didn't know. So a genogram is basically a family tree, but of emotions. And I include a blank one in the back of my book with different symbols so you guys can make your own. And in a genogram, you connect, don't read the end of the book, just look for the genogram. I see everyone flipping to the back of the book. Don't read the last page. Um, but yes, a genogram, it, you can see it has all these little boxes and it looks like a family tree and they're symbols. But the symbols are everything from, you know, control dynamics, neglect, abuse, um, love, you know, all the different kind of emotional dynamics. And when you can follow those through the generations, and you can create your own symbols. It's really interesting, again, to see how it is that we're born into a constellation. And I found things out about my family and the dynamics of, of relationships and the women in my family that they hadn't actually realized. And as you know, going and asking these questions like, hey, why did great grandma leave great grandpa when she was pregnant, which was a question that I asked, um, was hard, no, not a lot of people want to talk about that, but it was relevant because my mom left my sister's dad when she was pregnant, right? So 
asking these questions sometimes make people uncomfortable. And sometimes when we're the ones that are opening these boxes, people in our family are, are begrudgingly not wanting to open them. But when we're trying to understand ourselves, I found it was very valuable. And childhood was tough because, you know, my, some of my most traumatic moments and difficult moments in my childhood were also my mother's. And, you know, we feel a lot of responsibility to protect people and to not open wounds that maybe they don't want to open for themselves. And, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for my mom because she didn't tell me to hold anything back. And I went and read everything to her before I finalized it because, again, out of respect. But these are memories that, and what she eventually told me, was that you know telling the truth is actually healing for everyone, even when the truth is hard. You know, even if it's not in a book, even if it's just admitting it to each other and validating that to each other, that yeah, that happened, that wasn't normal. The parentification, which is the second trailblazer toll, the fact that a lot of times as first gen, we find ourselves being kind of the emotional caretaker or even sometimes the parent to our parents, whether it's filling out forms in a different language or whether it's literally comforting a parent who is dating like I was. You know, I had a parent who was actively dating when I was a child and I found myself getting into that mix in a lot of ways. You know, that, when we are a kid, you don't necessarily realize the tentacles of that that later for me turned into people pleasing or turned into hypervigilance in my relationships, you know, or just turned into choosing people that weren't the best for me. So it's hard to examine these things at the same time, you know, they're gonna come up whether or not we talk about them. And you can't heal from that which you don't name. And part of this is to have that conversation because we all deserve, I'm speaking we as in first gen, but beyond first gen, but especially first gen, we all deserve that when we reach these places and these schools and all the amazing jobs you're all going to have, to come out the other side of the sausage maker feeling balanced and whole and healed and not in a lot of ways how I would feel, which is I'd reach, I'd be at graduation from college and I'd feel like sad for some feel, re reason and I couldn't figure out why. You're making me feel all the emotions right now. So, um, good. right. No, and you know, and I appreciate it, you saying that, because I think we talked a little bit about it, um, about just like the importance of naming uh, these experiences for us as first gen and and really like stepping away, step, stepping into our truth, but also at the same time kind of stepping away from like the shame that sometimes comes with some of our experiences uh, of being the first and only if we're unfamiliar, right, with the spaces. We talked about low income and, and, um, and just the experience that comes with all of that. So thank you for, for naming all of those things. Um, along those lines, you know, you mentioned these eight components, which um, I absolutely love because it kind of allowed me to digest your experience and my experience in these ways, like name them, right? Like, oh, that's what that, you know, that fits under that. Obviously, you mentioned like this is not an exhaustive list. You know, there's multiple other ways that that folks can name them or, or um, just create space for them. But I'm curious to know, um, through your life experience, did you find yourself in maybe one component more than other? Um, does that shift maybe as you grew up? Um, and does maybe that still happen, you know, currently? Yes, it does shift. It does currently happen. And, you know, I, I always say you want we want to warn ourselves to not go from being kind of this high achieving, overachieving as a coping mechanism person like I was to being like a healing perfectionist, right? So I'm not sitting here saying that I have it all figured out or that this list doesn't need five more things on it, but it's a starting point for us to start talking about it because there's no umbrella usually over these things. I don't know about you guys, but I hear a lot about imposter syndrome. And I heard about imposter syndrome since I was a kid. It was almost like this like virus I was gonna get. The imposter syndrome's coming, you know, be careful. And even though it, yes, it is a thing, I actually push back on the book on the fact that that's the central thing because the central problem of the dynamics isn't that we aren't confident enough at the end of the day. To put that all back on us, it did not sit right with me. There are ways that systems are set up that no matter how confident you are, 
you're going to walk out at the end of the day and not feel great. I mean, I walked into the White House every morning feeling pretty confident. You know, when I walked out some days and didn't feel confident, it wasn't because somehow the imposter syndrome had attacked me. You know, there were, there were other things at play. And to that note, I actually wanted to talk about, so a lot of this feels anecdotal, which we all know it's widespread and it's not. But I commissioned a national poll of first-gen students across the country during this time, actually last month, because I really wanted to hear from students themselves, and I'm so excited to engage in a conversation with you guys. But we asked, you know, first of all, is it a negative impact on your emotional, mental health to be a first-gen student? Not surprisingly, 65% said yes. But what was interesting is we asked what, what aspects of it are the most difficult and again, imposter syndrome was the lowest on the list. The highest on the list, financial trauma, and I see nodding heads, and loneliness and isolation. So let's talk about that part, and not just imposter syndrome, which might make you feel more lonely and isolated to think that it's also your fault, that you might not feel comfortable. Um, the one that still cycles through my life is breakaway guilt. And you can experience that at so many different points, right? But the breakaway guilt that I felt was I went away for 10 years and you know, went and worked on my career and did all these different things and had these different experiences. And then I came home and realized that my life was the only one that really had changed. And that didn't feel good. And it, was a, it wasn't a, a homecoming that was as as, fuzz, as warm and fuzzy as you'd imagine. And not because my family wasn't proud of me and not because they didn't love me or, you know, I, I wanna make it clear that I do believe that for the, for the most part, I'll just speak of my experience, that people were doing the best they could. But folks didn't ask very much about my experience. They didn't ask how it was going in and, and my school or how classes were or how hard it was or what the White House was like when I got there. And that was hard. And I would also find myself going on vacations or, or going to these cool dinners or something like that and thinking, God, I wish my mom could experience this. Or like, it's not, how do I bring folks with me? And what responsibility do we have to stabilize our own finances because of all the financial trauma we and loans and all of that that we just took on, like how do you put the mask on yourself first in a lot of ways and not feel horrible for doing that? And that, the more you break away, just kind of becomes a, a bigger chasm, right? So I think that one has the most tentacles. That one in childhood, I mean, surprise, surprise, like those two things, you know? The, the bookends are kind of like the ones that still come up. And, and I keep saying, like, this is work that I do every day, to be clear. You know, this isn't me coming with this book saying, here's how you heal from the first gen experience, because, you know, this is, this is the fabric of who we are. But in the book, and I'm going to say in the back of the book, and don't start flipping the back of the book again, but in the back of the book, I, put, I list resources that helped me, that still help me, that I talk about in the book, you know, not hypothetical and modalities. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll get into it later, but when I was you guys' age, I had horrible panic attacks. You know, I, on my first day of freshman orientation, passed out right next to Tommy Trojan, as it, it was so much pressure that I was putting on myself, and that of, of all the ways that my life had changed from hanging out with my gangster boyfriend in high school to all of a sudden being at USC and like being in the Greek system, and it was just like too, it was my head was spinning, right? It was just too much all at once trying to balance. Um. I, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the part that you mentioned about the guilt, right? Because I think like that's a conversation that I've often had with multiple students here um, in multiple institutions, right? Particularly those are, are first gen. Um, it's so real. And, and I remember reading in your book like talking about like you changed and not the rest, you know, not the rest of, of the folks that your family or so. And it's interesting, and I remember reading it and I remember crying, right? I think I, I might still have some tears in my book, but um, I remember reading it because it felt so real, right? Um, I went to Michigan State. I was the first one in my family to, 
I'm the first one in my family to go to college, but I'm also the first one in my family to leave California. And so that was a big deal for my family. So I would call my mom every weekend and be, and how are things, how are things, you know, and I would tell her updates um, because I wanted her to experience kind of through what I was sharing with her. And I remember there was this one time she told me, why do you keep asking me like how, like, if there's anything different with people, like nobody has changed, right? Nadie cambió, solo tú, right? Nobody changed, only you. And oh, that like hurt, right? It was heavy. And obviously she didn't, it wasn't ill intended or anything, but I think it was that guilt, right? And so, and so I appreciate you naming that because I think it's so real um, as it relates a lot to the loneliness, right? And the pull that you mentioned. And, um, and kind of along those lines, um, one of the things that, that really made me think about is um, something that you wrote. And, and I'm gonna quote you because I think that they were perfect words to describe it. And so it says, um, page 112, and if anybody wants to follow along. I love this is a school <laughs> and everyone's like turning to pages, I love it. <laughs> so it says, first and only, we have dual citizenship to two worlds that often appear at odds with each other. And then it ends with saying, when we've learned to survive alternating between different selves, how do we ever know for sure what our authentic identity is? And so I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, since writing your memoir, do you believe that you have found your authentic self um, or maybe a happy medium between these two worlds? Um, or do you feel like as first gens, we will always exist in the middle, middle of these two worlds? There is so much to unpack in that question. We could Very talk lower. about that for like a week. Um, yeah, I think a lot of this experience feels like we have to become someone or reach something or attain some version of ourselves. And what I learned through the process is that this journey is actually remembering who you've always been because we all exist in these intersections. We don't have to do anything. You know, I remember having a conversation with a student who was telling me like how, the same thing, like how do you bridge, how do you stand in between these two worlds and socioeconomically or culturally, ethnicity, like all of it, how do you do it? And what I told her was you don't have to do anything. Like you are the bridge, you already exist as the personification of those two worlds. You just have to be yourselves as unapologetically as possible. And that means that I have the Nike Cortez sitting next to the Louboutins in my, in my closet, right? That means that you, you go and feel comfortable with all types of people. You go home and you don't think you're better than anybody. And then you go in these boardrooms and you don't think that you're lesser than anyone. You know, it's finding that space that we all already have but the layers of varnish that we put on through the years kind of dulls it in some ways. And so I think that my journey was to start taking off those layers. I, I see like social mobility as have like, almost like expecting you to have many costume changes. Some, uh, some folks, and man, I admire them, they're like, I don't care where I am, this is who I am. That isn't, who I, uh, that isn't how I was. I wasn't confident enough to be that way. I would move into different spaces and I would be like, okay, what do I need to do here? Okay, how do I just survive here? And it created this, this kind of part of me that felt like it was always morphing and I couldn't get to the core anymore. If you're reacting and dressing and you know, kind of dodging to be what you need to be in that space, where is your actual emotional experience that's authentic? And it struck me that as I moved through my life, if I didn't find that, it didn't matter what I accomplished. I would, I would accomplish these things and just feel lonely. And I wouldn't have authentic relationships to come home to at night. So I think it's something we... I remind myself of constantly because there's always, and I say this in the book, there's always gonna be a part of me that like tracks my belonging in spaces. You know, it's just kind of a part of me since I was a kid. I'll just get in a room and I'll be like, do, 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 you know? And you have to remind yourself that those differences are actually your superpowers. 
and hanging a lantern on those things, that's when you come into yourself because yourself already has all the ingredients. When I was, I didn't learn anything after the point I was sitting in your seats that helped me do anything that I ended up doing. Like all the things, the perspectives, the gut, the instinct, all the things that contribute to my career, I had when I was sitting there in undergrad. But you know, we, we think that there's we think that there's some sort of nugget of information or some sort of way to morph ourselves to get to that point, but it's not true. So we've talked about guilt. We talked about imposter syndrome. We talked about... It's very uplifting right. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I promise the book is not depressing. It's not. It's not, so right? It is not I a depressing book. I actually want to um, shift the energy a little bit and, and um, talk a little bit more about, like, at the end, you share... Um, and you say, you know, you want to give yourself permission to focus on joy and peace. And so, which I believe is such a powerful message for everyone, really, but specifically for first gen, um, because we're often socialized to believe that we have to consistently be productive, right? That productivity is our worth and we have to be busy and doing something and, not, and prove ourselves, right? Um, and so, do you believe that before this moment, um, at any point before that, somewhere, you know, anywhere in, in your story that you gave yourself permission um, for joy and peace? And um, if you didn't, right, what is maybe some way that you would encourage our first and onlys in the um, today to find that, that peace and joy or moments of peace and joy? Well... Like I say clearly in the book, I do not have all the answers. And peace and joy looks different for all of us. So I can't sit here and tell you guys how to do it for you. But one of the big parts for me was to really tell the truth to myself. You don't have to write a book, even though you all should. Um, to tell the truth to myself about what my own experience was and to validate my own emotions in ways that I felt like they hadn't always been or I had looked to outside people to do that. And also to support each other and find that sense of community in each other. Because like we said, this is very isolating, but I'm gonna guess that probably everyone in this room found this to be an interesting topic because it relates or resonates with you to a degree. So like look around at the people in this room, like this is your tribe. And that actually helped me a lot. I found my tribe when I was in grad school and you know, I cling to them and we cheer for each other in ways that sometimes we don't hear from our families or communities. I talk about in the book that I lost my best friend from home, our relationship totally fractured when I went away to grad school. You know, these sometimes we do lose relationships because our lives tend to diverge and folks can be like, You changed. Like, how much do we hear this? You've changed. Yeah, which is frustrating because aren't we all supposed to change? Like, aren't we all supposed to grow and evolve through our experience? And somehow it's kind of lobbed against first and onlys as, you know, what they're doing to kind of grow and change in their experience is somehow invalidating who they are, which is not fair. When I got to USC, I had one of those moments that I'll just share briefly from the book. I, I'm just sharing some stories. Um, I got to USC, and like I told you, I was having a lot of panic attacks at the time, and I was feeling, you know, I had just, I don't want to give away too much, but, you know, my relationship that I was in had just ended in a really dramatic, painful way, and, you know, I was coming in there without ever having visited campus, even though I grew up, like, 15 miles from USC, but, like, who visits colleges? Who does like a college visit? Like we were, we were filling out the FAFSAs and I, I got my Pell Grant and I was like, okay, so I guess I'm gonna, I'll figure out how to pay for this, but we don't visit colleges. I think my mom and I, it was our first, it was our first time ever on campus. I made her come with me because I was so scared. And you know, you get there and I had that like moment where I passed out like under Tommy Trojan, kind of <laughs> telling. And my mom, of course, was freaking out. And she said, okay, like, let's take you to the campus, you know, health center, because we don't talk a lot about mental health sometimes in our families. And what just happened? Is she going crazy? Like, what's happening? So we go. They, I'm 17 years old. They hand me a bottle of Xanax. And they're like, okay, take this every four to six hours and sign up to see a psychologist. So now 
I had avoided drugs through high school. Uh, that was one of the things I avoided. And so now I'm sitting there with my mom on a bench on campus, and I pop a Xanax, and my, I'm, all of a sudden I'm floating, and I'm like, how am I going to get through college? Drugged? You know, and my mom is, of course, flipping into like gear to try to figure out like how to solve it. And she holds up uh, a brochure and it has all these blonde women in matching outfits saying friends forever. And she's like, I know, do this thing. You'll have a hundred new friends. They're called, it's called a sorority. So talk about going from one lion's den to another. All of a sudden, school hasn't even started. I haven't even made one friend yet, and I'm walking down the row at USC, wearing like literally like kind of like wannabe chola outfit, you know, with like brown lipstick and like black lace pants. I don't know how I got in to a house, but somehow I get accepted. So cut now to the second week of school. I'm, I have a sorority pledge pin. I've learned to now morph. I'm wearing clear lip gloss and Forever 21 knockoff Abercrombie shorts because I'm like, okay, new place to survive. This is how we're going to do it. And I'm walking, I see a campus club fair. And on the fair, there's butcher paper, and it says, you know, Mexican, Latino, you know, like the clubs. And so I go over there, and I'm like, oh, okay, my people. And I go up, and they look at me, and they look at my pledge pin, and they're like, uh-uh, you've already done that? You can't do this. And that was, that was a big moment for me, to be told that somehow you start forfeiting your Latinidad, your ethnicity, your right, your culture, you know, as you move through these spaces. And it's funny because people have asked me as I'm doing this book tour, like, well, how is it that you, you know, might have like shed that part of you in order to survive? I was like, uh-uh, if anything, I felt like it was being taken from me and I was constantly having to take it back. Like constantly have to be like, no, no, this is important to me. This is who I am. And so that's, that's part of the piece too, is not, shedding those layers or not letting those layers be taken from you and claiming them and, and reclaiming yourself. No, well, thank you for, for sharing that. And um, I, we could just, I think like speak on the first gen experience, like for a week, for right? Like 10 hours, yes. <laughs> for like ever. Right? And so I, I, I also want to just be mindful of time and give the audience some opportunity to, to ask some questions, right? The folks that are joining us today. So my last question to you is, as you reflect on your own experience and challenges and the hurdles of being a first and only, what advice, like if you had one piece of advice um, that you can give our first and onlys that are here with us today, what, what would that be? And I know that's also a loaded question, so <laughs> there's no right answer. Yeah, well, honestly, uh, I feel like I'm gonna reiterate some of what we've been saying, but you know, my advice is really to normalize this experience and in yourself and realize that, you know, what you're going through is so widespread. There's one third of college students right now are first gen. One third. But 90% don't graduate on time. And when you look at those two numbers, you're like, what's, what's happening there? And there's an answer there that is some work that we do, but there's an answer there that's some work that we can do with each other and ways that we can support each other. So my advice to you is to not wait until you're in your 40s like me to think about this. You know, Think about how it is that this moves through your life and be intentional about naming it and, and looking at your experiences in a way that validates them and how maybe others have it in the past. And to continue talking about this. And I, you know, it's, it's a big deal that your school has created space for this conversation. You guys have administrators and a campus here who supports you and wants to hold space for this conversation. Speak up about it and, and own it. Because one thing that I found in this poll was what, like, what just like superheroes the first gen community is. When you think of the kind of optimistic audacity against all odds, it's almost a rational belief that we have as a community, it's so beautiful. You know, 
when they you poll young people, I'm sure you guys all read it like I do, or they're like, X number of young people don't think they'll ever buy a house. X number of young people don't feel positive about where the world is going. X number, not this community. When you talk about first gen young people, oh, I'm buying a car. Oh, I'm buying a house. Oh, I'm paying off my loans. Oh, I'm gonna make more money than my parents. I'm gonna be able to do X, Y, Z. That's, that's a really unique thing that you guys all have. And so my advice is to hold on to that and to recognize that in yourself because that's why you're sitting in these seats is because you have this gene. We're talking about genes. You, you don't have a gene mutation. You guys have this really special superpower gene. So own it. No, thank you so much. I just wanna get, show her some love because um, I know how important that conversation was for me, so I'm sure it resonated with many of the folks that we have here today. So we are um, gonna open it up for any questions that folks have. Um, if you raise your hand, we have Please some. Please don't be shy. Yes, While we I have take some... a, a video of you guys because you're so beautiful. <laughs> we have some folks with mics and you can just raise your hand. Oh, we have a. Oh, he was just saying hi. I, ha hi. I have a question. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Don't be shy. Right Obviously, I'll, uh, I'll talk about anything. I'll kick it off. I'll, be, I'll, okay. I'll do it. And then I'll go to her. Um, I am also a writer. And like my goal, my dream is to write a book. Uh, but I also, we, we just had a talk on cybersecurity and being careful about AI. How do you manage, like, this is your story that is means so much to so many. How how do you kind of protect yourself from your work getting into the wrong hands almost, or like um, people spinning your story for something it isn't? How do how do you like protect something so precious? Well, who tells our story is important. So people are going to make what they will with your story. So you might as well be the one to tell it. That's how I feel about it. Um, but a lot of people like write books or tell their stories for different reasons. They want to be seen certain ways. And I think the best way to make sure that your story is authentically true to who you are, it, it ties back to a story I actually told in the book that I'll tell really quickly, which is, you know, when I was 12, my mom had just gotten out of uh, emotionally tipping onto a physically bu abusive relationship. And she had fallen into a postpartum depression. And I was kind of parked into a nonprofit to kind of help me. I thought I was going to like an acting writing class at the park, but it was really one of these creative arts nonprofits that teaches you confidence and, and skills. And so I'm in this group, and they're like, we're going to write plays. And they put a, a pen in my hand, and they're like, write about whatever you want. It was a great organization. And all of us started writing these plays that were kind of surprisingly dark because we were all just kind of purging these different emotions and things that we had seen and experienced. And mine, surprise, surprise, was around a breakup and depression, where one of the characters was literally nothingness. It was a personification of like this darkness. And it was really vulnerable. It was really true. I thought I was hiding behind the characters that no one really understood. But afterwards, you know, the actress that had been performing in my play I didn't know it, but she had just come off of doing What's Love Got to Do With It with Angela Bassett. And she had invited her to come to the play. And so I'm 12 years old, and I'm kind of like walking through the audience, and I feel a tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, and it's Angela Bassett. <laughs> and who oh, is was radiant, you know, this beautiful woman. And she says, you know, I just wanted to tell you that I really identified personally in my life with what it is that you wrote. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you identify with what I wrote. And the point isn't that my writing was like something that had like created the space. It's that anyone sharing vulnerably with authenticity like that, it creates this beautiful connective tissue that everyone feels less alone. It almost like sets this table. And I learned that lesson not like consciously because at that time I was just kind of reeling, but I came to understand that that lesson really changed my life. And so taking everything back to your question, you know, where the come from is in what you write, that'll change everything. Because if somebody were to tell me right now, I'm going to use your story to make it seem X, Y, Z, I know what the come from was. 
And so don't worry about what people will say or how they'll use your story or anything like that. You be honest and real and vulnerable, and the people it's meant to reach, it will reach. And everyone else is not meant for them. Oh, question. Hello, my name is Cruz. Um, I was uh, wondering, I know uh, you were very busy in the White House, but, and I know uh, Barack Obama's not first generation, but you know, he, I always thought of him as like he's a He's the first and only. He's, oh, he is, he's okay, okay. So I always thought of him as a bridge, like, like you, know, when you mentioned in your book. I was wondering if you ever had a chance to talk to him about these kind of things, about being you know, the little bridge between black and white or you know, whatever, two communities. Or yeah, well, when I got to the White House, I was like 28. And I, if I would have been like, excuse me, <laughs> I need to talk to you about it. I don't know how that would have gone. But I did get a chance to talk to him last week, ironically. I was at an event, and he was there. And I had a chance to go and, and tell him, you know, I just published this book. And I was like, you're in it. He's like, what? Uh, so, you know, I think that I say in the book that one of the biggest moments at the White House was saying goodbye to him and introducing him to my mother, which was like a whole, like, <laughs> we can all cry together about what that moment was like. But when I was saying goodbye to him and really just like telling him what it meant not only for me, but for my family, even for my community, because he was, a, he is a first. That's what I'm saying. Let's expand the definition. I mean, can you be more of a first generation experience than being the first black president in the United States? You know, at Harvard Law Review too, he was a first. You know, he's crossed so many thresholds for his family. That's what I'm saying, that like this is an experience that is so much more widespread than we give ourselves credit for. Hi, my name is B. I go to Pitzer College. I just Hi. wanted to ask, um, how do you manage, um, like, basically living up to the standards of other first gen, like, students, um, just colleagues in general? I know, like, for me, it feels like there are just so many amazing first gen people out here, and I feel very mediocre. Like, I'm not really accomplishing as much. And how do you dis like distinguish those comparisons? How do you not compare yourself? How do you look at yourself as a person who has also come a long way despite not having the same accolades as the next? That's a great question, and thank you for the vulnerable question. It's interesting when you start thinking about perfectionism trauma, which is what a lot of people and I'll speak for myself, part of what I carried, you know, when we look at each other and all these things that we're accomplishing, and that's not to take away from the beauty of what we're accomplishing, but the more I was in this hot and cold, chaotic relationship with my boyfriend in high school where he was just kind of like putting me through it, the higher my grades would go, right? Because a lot of times, that's how we kind of have some sense of control. Join the club, become the president of this, like get those grades, like it's almost like this white knuckling experience. And that's not to take away from high achieving young people, but it's also to kind of unpack like, and to hold space that sometimes folks that you see like going, 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 it isn't always so much that, they're smarter, better, like it's all coming from different places. And part of that is also giving ourselves grace to not always have to be the one who has to be the president of every club. You know, that, that is not like our emotional labor to carry, to make our entire family sacrifices worth it, to use our life to make everyone's family sacrifices worth it. But what I wanna tell you is you literally being here you, you've already killed it. Because getting from my childhood to college was way harder than getting from college to the White House. Real talk, okay? So I also wanna center the pride that you should feel being in this school and graduating from this school when you do and, and making a life for yourself. Because continuing on, 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 and on, on, and on, trying to like, grab more apples from the top of the tree. That doesn't necessarily mean a better life. That doesn't mean a more balanced life either. You can do whatever you want, and you can also stop and just be happy whenever you want.
One last question, anyone? Ah, we do have one. Okay. Oh. Oh, another one over there. Hi, um, so I'm a staff member here. Um, so I was also a first generation, um, graduated with my bachelor's, first in my family to go to college. Um, and you kind of mentioned like kind of talking about how you try to go to like the Latin clubs and they kind of turned you away. So I, in my experiences, I have also had people tell me like, oh, you're very Americanized because you went to school, you got your degree or I speak properly and um so what do you say to people who try to like kind of tone down like all the successes you have done and like especially like in like the latin community i feel like in a way like i feel like i kind of look down upon for some people but also like held higher to other people like in my family they look at me as like oh wow she graduated college but other like friends or people will say like, oh, well, you're really Americanized. What or would you say literally you're acting white. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's say what they really say. That's yeah. what they say. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I heard it too. It's like when I was in school, in high school, I was acting white for getting, you know, good grades or using certain words. And when I was in college, it was like spicy Latina, and I was I was like, what should I be for Halloween? Should I? Oh, it was a Disney princess like kind of theme party, and it was, and they're like Pocahontas, and I'm like, oh, interesting. I became this like very you know ethnic woman when I got to college in a way that wasn't reflected back to me in high school in a, in a different way. The answer is you can't you can't make anyone happy. You just can't and. The longer you try, the, the more you're just going to torture yourself because it goes back to what we were talking about before. You aren't acting anything. You aren't being anything. You're just being yourself. And if you want to go to school, if you want to listen to rancheras, if you, whatever that looks like for you, that's, that's who you are. It's a, a tapestry of the parts of you that are, that are meaningful. So uh, it's, it may not be like the, the snappiest answer, but there is no way to make everyone happy. And that's how come a big part of the story in this book is to stop abandoning yourself and to come back to yourself and making yourself happy and finding that inwardly and not being on this constant striving, morphing to survive conveyor belt and stepping off of it eventually. Um, it was a conscious decision for me to stop doing that and to be like, I'm Latina because I'm Latina. You know, the things that interest me interest me because they're my interests. Like, there's no, just because people want you to pick a box doesn't mean you have to. And a lot of times the boxes they'll put you in are the opposite of the ones that you'd choose for yourself. So I've kind of made a career and a life out of kicking open boxes. And that would be my advice to you. And I'll be there signing books, so if anyone doesn't feel like saying something in front of the group, come and, and get a book and, and ask me a question then. Okay. I may, I, so I had two questions, but I'll ask the second one to respect everyone's time when I get to um, meet in person. So my main question then is, um, so they always say like anxiety is the fear of the future, depression is the fear of the past. Um, in your journey for seeking that authenticity and maintaining that authenticity, authenticity, how did you or do you continue to stay present while you're on that journey so that you're not stuck in the future or stuck in the past? Well, it's an everyday choice, and I talk about some of the things that the, in the resources of the book. You know, I, for me, it's spending a lot of time in nature. Nature makes me feel really balanced. Um, spending time with my family, um, but also spending time alone, you know, thinking about what I want to do, centering the things that interest me, which a lot of times we're kind of 
looking outward, you know, to our families or so on. That can be a part of the first gen experience. So, you know, I didn't. I don't think I picked what toppings we put on our pizza until I was like probably in, in college. I was always kind of just doing what everyone else wanted to do to keep peace, you know, around me. So, um, but meditating, faith is really important to me. And I, I, I say spirituality more than anything, but I, I come from a Catholic, Latino, Mexican household that, you know, praying novenas and, you know, putting crosses on each other's um, foreheads was just like what we always did. And the way that that continues to go through my life as far as, you know, feeling that there's a groundedness and, and a faith in something bigger than myself. Um, yeah, but like I said, choosing the people you have around you very consciously and continuing to do the work. You know, I'm still unpacking different parts of my life and I'm still, you know, having these conversations and, and so on because, like I said, we're not going to switch from being like high achieving to being healing perfectionists. We're going to allow ourselves to just have our own humanity and our complicated, um, contradictory selves being enough. Wow. Uh, thank you, Alejandra, for bringing your story to scripts. Um, and along with Elba, relating it back to First Gen and your book and all the things, the feelings, the journey that goes with it. We really do appreciate that. And I think I can speak on behalf of this room. It was real. And I really thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming. And absolutely. help me spread the word. If, if you appreciate this book and you read it and you like it, post about it, tag me, and help spread the word because these stories, you know, in, in books and in literary circles aren't always told. And it's important to send the message that, you know, there, there is a community out there who cares about these topics. Thank you. And I want to I wanna especially thank the folks from CLSA. Chicana Latino Student Affairs, Tony Jimenez, Sochi Casillas, Miriam Escobedo. Thank you to Marcom Events. Thank you to the audience. We appreciate all of you. And please come back. There's going to be a, 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 a book signing in the back. So we'll get you all squared away. Thank you.